This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. My uh, presentation is called The Lost Early History of Unitarian Christian Theology. The Christian Bible does not explicitly affirm any Trinity doctrine. Apologists and conservative theologians argue that at least the New Testament is implicitly Trinitarian. That is, while it does not explicitly say that the one God eternally exists in three equally divine persons, what it does say logically implies that. In my view, this is false. The most a Trinitarian can claim is that her theory best explains what is stated in the Bible. To back up this claim, she can't merely cite proof texts, but must compare Trinitarian theologies to their rivals to see which one best fits and best explains the text. In contemporary theology, this is almost never done. Part of the reason rivals to Trinitarian theology are never considered is that the history of Christian theology is viewed as a long struggle to find adequate language for what the New Testament was already understood to teach and what had always been believed by faithful Christians. The idea is that somehow early Christians managed to be Trinitarians, though their teachers could not find adequate language for this truth, which was finally well expressed only in the 300s. To my eye, this is a partisan misunderstanding of the early history of Christian theology. In this talk, I will show that four intellectual leaders in the early Catholic or proto-Catholic Christianity uh, were not halfway Trinitarians, inconsistent Trinitarians, or Trinitarians struggling to express their Trinitarianism. <laughs> to the contrary, they were Unitarians, and so not Trinitarians of any sort. I've chosen to focus on writings from about 150 to 250, because this is the, t this is the period when systematic th Christian theology began, as Christians used any useful tool they could find in Greek and Roman learning. Virtually none of the points I am making here are unique to me. Many have been made by scholars specializing in these early theologians, and most have been previously made by famous Unitarian Christian scholars, such as John Biddle, Samuel Clark, and Alvin Lamson. And if you're interested in reading some of that material from the early modern era, you can Google the words Trinity's books and you will find uh, where I've reprinted some of those. Careful thinking requires carefully defined terms. A Trinitarian Christian theology says that eternally, the one God ex in some sense contains or consists of three equally divine persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In contrast, a Unitarian Christian theology asserts that the one God is numerically one with the Father of Jesus and not with anyone else. On this sort of theology, God is, they sometimes say, unipersonal, which is to say that God just is a certain self, a perfect self. No consistent person could hold to both views, although a person might have a theology which is neither. Applying these definitions, how does one tell that a theologian is not a Trinitarian? If he thinks of the one God as a certain single self, that person is not a Trinitarian, but a Unitarian. And if someone thinks it false that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equally divine, then whatever he is, he's not a Trinitarian. A Unitarian Christian theology need not be a modern or post-Reformation theory. It is true that when Christians went back to the sources in the 16th century, many of them found no Trinity doctrine there, but they were hardly the first to see the one true God as a certain single self. Nor should a Unitarian be understood as an anti-Trinitarian. While many Unitarians nowadays do define their view in opposition to mainstream creed-based theologies, a Unitarian needn't have ever even heard of any Trinity theory nor need a Unitarian be a rationalist or deist or a denier of miracles. Again, the word Unitarian is a simple descriptive term. It is not used here as the name of any specific group or denomination. It was only in the late 18th century that there began to be churches calling themselves Unitarian with a capital U. Another mistake is thinking that Christian theology is by definition Trinitarian. If that were so, then Christian theology wouldn't have existed until sometime in the fourth century. A final and common confusion, even among professional theologians, is that early mainstream theologians weren't exactly Trinitarians, but were proto-Trinitarian, partially Trinitarian, not quite perfectly Trinitarian, quasi-Trinitarian, etc. <laughs> we will see that this is not so. 
Let's go back then to perhaps around 50 years after the last New Testament book was written. So there's the New Testament era, you know, roughly up to, up to the year 100 or so. Our first theologian is the fascinating Justin Martyr, so-called because he was executed by the Romans for refusing to make legally required pagan sacrifices. When threatened with death, Justin and his friends told the prefect of Rome, quote, do what you will, for we are Christians and do not sacrifice to idols. Justin tells us that he tried out a number of schools of Greek philosophy before becoming a Christian, still much influenced by what he thought was the best of them, Platonism. He argued for official toleration of Christianity. And in a fascinating book, fascinating book called Dialogue with Trypho the Jew, probably based on a real conversation he had in the 130s, he argues about Old Testament prophecies and many other theological matters. Does he urge his Jewish friend to believe in the triune God? Or is he a Unitarian, or neither one? Let's hear some of what he says. So Justin says, there never will be, nor has there ever been from eternity, any other God except him who created and formed the universe. Furthermore, we do not claim that our God is different from yours, for he is the God who, with a strong hand and outstretched arm, led your forefathers out of the land of Egypt. Nor have we placed our trust in any other, for indeed there is no other, but only in him, whom you have also trusted, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And in Justin's first apology, he says, quote, we are not atheists since we worship the maker of this universe. Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ. And we will show that we worship him rationally, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself and holding him in the second place. Yeah, so in his first, in his first apology, he says, we are not atheists since we worship the maker of this universe. Our teacher of these things is Jesus Christ, and we will show that we worship him rationally, having learned that he is the son of the true God himself, and holding him in the second place, and the prophetic spirit in the third rank. So far we've seen that the one true God for Justin is the God of the Jews, and is one and the same as the Father of Jesus. Justin is a Unitarian. But one may wonder if he's a Trinitarian because he mentions worshiping or honoring the Son and Spirit in addition to God. But he's not worshiping the Trinity as the one God. He's plainly said who the true God is, and that is the Father. Also, he ranks them, presumably in degree or kind of honor which is due to each, into first, second, and third places. Also, it is clear that unlike many modern people, Justin does not reserve religious honor to God alone. Thus. In his first apology, he says, quote, we are atheists with, with reference to God such as these, in the context he means the demons worshiped by pagans, but not with reference to the most true God, the father of righteousness and temperance and other virtues who is unmixed with evil. But we worship and adore both him and the son who came from him and taught us these things and the army of the other good angels who follow him and are made like him and the prophetic spirit giving honor in reason and truth, and to everyone who wishes to learn, handing over without grudging what we have been taught. Justin is rhetorically emphasizing the wideness of Christian piety, rebutting the charge that Christians are godless. Perhaps he means that Christians honor angels only in the minimal sense that they believe in and teach about them, my purpose isn't to defend Justin's statement, but just to point out that Justin is willing to talk of worshiping and adoring various beings in addition to God. So the fact that he worships and adores the Son and Spirit doesn't show that he thinks them to be equally divine with the Father. In fact, we know that he does not so believe. Justin's Platonism makes him think it impossible that the transcendent God should have himself created. He can't, as it were, get his hands dirty making the material world. So when it was time to create, he caused the word, the pre-human Jesus, to exist, who then created for him. Justin also thinks it impossible that God should have appeared in Old Testament theophanies. This role, too, he assigns to the Logos, to the pre-human Son. The status of the Holy Spirit for him is unclear. In any case, the Son is not equally divine with the Father because he is not co-eternal with the Father and because he is caused to exist by the Father. Justin is not a Trinitarian, but he is a Unitarian. One can easily be distracted by Justin's God talk 
Actually, this is a source of confusion in all four of our authors, often exacerbated by their translators. When you see the English word God there, capital G, the author may have in mind one of three things. They may have written one of three things. If the Greek has the definite article, the word the, ha in Greek, what is being translated as ha theos, literally the God, which we have a long tradition of translating as God with a capital G. This has an initial capital letter like a proper name. This makes sense for the phrase the God is a singular referring term, the function of which is not to describe, but simply to refer, just like a proper name like Mike or Sally. However, the author may have written only theos in Greek, or deus in Latin, a language which has no definite article. Such is often translated as a god, but is sometimes translated as god, with a capital G. The use of this phrase would normally be descriptive. It would be saying what kind of being someone is, just as I might specify that Skippy is a cat rather than a human. Finally, one must remember that neither language has quotation marks. If I say there are several mics in this room, I'm not naming a single person by that word, nor am I talking about a kind of being, as with the term God, lowercase, uh, human, or cat. What I'm saying is there are several people here called Mike. Similarly, in these author authors, often what they are saying uh, when they say that Jesus is theos or deus, uh, they mean that he is another being in addition to God who can be called by the title or name God. So, I mean, it would be more accurate in those cases to translate that Jesus is God with the, with the quotation marks. That is, he's, it's like saying he's another Mike. He's another one that goes by this name. Justin frequently makes points about God language for instance, he argues from Platonic premises that often the God referred to in Old Testament text must be the Son of God rather than the one true God. But let's move on to our second author. Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon in present-day France at the end of the 100s. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of Papias, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. Much of what we know about varieties of ancient Gnostic Christianity come from his writings. He argues correctly that they were unfaithful to the apostolic witness on many key points, to put it mildly. <laughs> Who, according to Irenaeus, is the one true God, the Trinity or the Father of Jesus? Let's listen to him. Quote, Wherefore, I do also call upon thee, Lord God of Abraham and God of Isaac and God of Jacob and Israel, who art the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who, through the abundance of thy mercy, hast had a favor toward us, that we should know thee, who hast made heaven and earth, who rulest over all, who art the only and the true God, above whom there is no other God. Grant by our Lord Jesus Christ the governing power of the Holy Spirit. Give to every reader of this book to know thee, that thou art God alone to be strengthened in thee and to avoid every heretical and godless and impious doctrine. Later in the book, Irenaeus says, neither the prophets nor the apostles nor the Lord Christ in his own person did acknowledge any other Lord or God but the God and Lord supreme. The prophets and the apostles confessing the Father and the Son, but naming no other as God, he means than the Father, and confessing no other as Lord, he means than the Son. And the Lord himself, in other words, Jesus, handing down to his disciples that he, the Father, is the only God and Lord who is God and ruler of all. It is incumbent on us to follow, if we are their disciples indeed, their testimonies to this effect. Jesus did not declare to them another God besides him who made the promise to Abraham. There is therefore one and the same God, the Father of our Lord, who also promised through the prophets that he would send his forerunner, he means John the Baptist, uh, and his salvation, that is the word, he caused to be made visible to all flesh, the word himself being made incarnate, end quote. It couldn't be clearer. For Irenaeus, the one true God is not the Trinity, not a triune God, but rather the Father of Jesus, just like the New Testament says. 
But isn't the Son for Irenaeus equally divine with the Father? No. According to Irenaeus, the Father knows more than the Son knows and is greater than the Son. Listen to him argue against certain Gnostics. He says, quote, But beyond reason, inflated with your own wisdom, you presumptuously maintain that you are, you are acquainted with the unspeakable mysteries of God, while even the Lord, the very Son of God, allowed that the Father alone knows the very day and hour of judgment, when he plainly declares, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, neither the Father but the Son only. He says, The Son was not ashamed to ascribe the knowledge of that day to the Father only. If anyone should acquire the reason why the Father, who has fellowship with the Son in all things, has been declared by the Lord alone to know the hour and the day of judgment, he will find at present no more suitable or becoming or safe reason than this, since indeed the Lord is the only Master, that we may learn through him that the Father is above all things. For the Father, he says, is greater than I. The Father, therefore, has been declared by our Lord to excel with respect to knowledge. For this reason, that we too, as long as we are connected with the scheme of things in this world, should leave perfect knowledge and such questions as have been mentioned to God, and should not, by any chance, while we seek to investigate the sublime nature of the Father, fall into the danger of starting the question whether there is another God above God. End quote. Sometimes in his arguments against the Gnostics, Irenaeus pauses to cite a common creed, presumably baptismal creeds, at any rate summaries of belief which he says are used by Catholic Christians in the late 100s. Here is one of them. The rule of truth which we hold is that there is one God Almighty who made all things by his word and fashioned and formed out of that which has no existence all things which exist, the Father made all things by him. For God needs none of these things, but is he who, by his word and spirit, makes and disposes and governs all things and commands all things into existence. He who formed the world is the God of Abraham, above whom there is no other God. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. For Irenaeus, the Father and the one God, and the God of Abraham are one and the same. The word, that is for him the pre-human Jesus, and the Spirit are his instruments in the creation and governance of the cosmos. But the ultimate source of all else, including these two instruments, is God, that is, the Father. These three are nowhere said by Irenaeus to be or to compose the one true God, nor are they equally divine. The Father is divine in a way in which nothing else is. Irenaeus is not a Trinitarian, but he is a Unitarian. Tertullian was a pugnacious African controversialist and is sometimes hailed as the first Trinitarian theologian. He seems to have been the first to use the Latin word Trinitas for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He also says that this Trinity is, quote, one substance. Looking through the spectacles of the fourth century Catholic controversies and creeds, one might see a triune God in his writings but that sight is a mirage. Tertullian is not a Trinitarian of any sort, not even an inconsistent one or a partway one, or one with less than ideal terminology. He is a Unitarian, albeit an aggressively speculative one. For Tertullian, the one God is not the Trinity, rather the one God is a member of the Trinity. Trinity with a small t, as I'll explain. Listen to him very carefully. You have to listen to him very carefully. <clears throat> he says, Nor do we differ from the Jews concerning God. We must make, therefore, a remark or two as to Christ's divinity. He, Christ, proceeds forth from God, and in that procession he is generated, so that he is the Son of God and is called God from unity of substance with God. For God, too, is a spirit. Even when, a ray, even when the ray is shot from the sun, it is still part of the parent mass. The sun will still be in the ray because it is a ray of the sun. There is no division of substance, but merely an extension. Thus Christ is spirit of spirit, and God of God as light of light is kindled. The material matrix remains entire and unimpaired. 
though you derive from it any number of shoots possessed of its qualities. That which has come forth out of God is at once God and the Son of God, and the two are one. In this way, he is made a second in manner of existence, in position, not in nature. And he did not withdraw from the original source, but went forth. This ray of God descending into a certain virgin and made flesh in her womb is in his birth God and man united. Okay, God of God. Isn't Tertullian preaching two gods and not one? Well, Tertullian was very familiar with this sort of objection. Let's listen some more. He says, all simple people, not to say the wise and unprofessional, who always constitute the majority of believers, since even the, since even the rule of faith itself removes from them the plurality of the gods of this world to the one true God, those simple folk become greatly terrified through their failure to understand that while he must be believed to be one, it is along with his economy, because they judge that economy implying a number and arrangement of trinity. Notice the translator uses a small t. That's correct, as I'll explain. Uh, that economy implying a number and arrangement of trinity is really a division of unity, whereas unity deriving trinity from itself is not destroyed by it, but made serviceable. Therefore they, he means the simple, circulate the statement that two and three are preached by us while they judge that they are worshipers of the one God. We hold to monarchy, they say. Okay, what's going on here? Well, it'll take some splaining. <laughs> here Tertullian admits that this sort of logos theory, which was popular among some of the educated Gentile Catholic elite in the late 100s and early 200s, he admits that that was very controversial among common Christians who wondered if Jesus was being misunderstood as a second God equal to his father. And note that he uses the word Trinity. Is this not a dead giveaway that he's a Trinitarian? No. Note that the translator here has not capitalized the word Trinity. In my view, this is correct. The word Trinity has come to mean a tripersonal God consisting of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is used as a singular referring term for the one God, assumed to be triune. But both now and then, the word Trinity can simply refer to these three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It is what philosophers call a plural referring term, and use of it does not imply that the items mentioned are parts of one whole, or that they are in any way equal, or even that they are things of the same kind. Many Christians from Trinitarians nowadays who say that the Bible is all about the Trinity, well, see, that's true in the second sense. It's all about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit without prejudicing the, the, the ontological nature of those three. That's true. It's false if it's, if it's in the first sense, capitalized. So uh, Trinitarians still use the word Trinity like this, merely as a plural referring term. And so do many early modern Unitarians, such as Samuel Clark and John Biddle. They use the word in that way too. They, uh, Samuel <coughs> Clark calls his book The Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, now confusingly, they, they capitalize it. I, I use, and some other authors use capital T Trinity for the triune God and lowercase trinity just for this triad, this, this group of three, this plurality. Tertullian is using the word in this latter way. For him, the trinity is a triad, a group, a plurality, consisting of those three selves mentioned. This plurality is not a god for him. Here is my graphic illustration of Tertullian's trinity. Again, not a triune god, but rather a triad or group of three with God as the founding member, as it were. Under the influence of Stoic philosophy, Tertullian believes that all real things are material things, including God. God is a spirit, and a spirit, he thinks, is a material thing made out of a finer sort of matter. So there's three stages here. There's a temporal progression. In the first stage, at the beginning, God is alone. Of course, he has his own reason within him, but that reason is not another being. It's just an attribute of his. 
Then when it's time to create, stage two, he brings the sun into existence using but not losing a portion of his spiritual matter. So he makes some of his matter to compose not just him, but also somebody else. Then the sun, using a portion of the divine matter shared with him, brings into existence the spirit. And the two of them are God's instruments, his agents in the creation and governance of the cosmos. Now the one thing that's confusing about my chart is it looks like one blob, like it's one thing with three parts. Um, but Christ on this theory is not God himself, nor is he divine in the same sense the Father is. Rather, the Son is divine in exactly this sense, that he's made of a portion of the same batch of matter, the same spiritual stuff that the Father is composed of. This makes them, quote, one substance that is made of the same stuff, or not different as to essence. But the Son isn't the same God as the Father, though he can, because of what he's made of, be called a God or God. In his text, uh, just Theos, or Deus. Nor is there any tripersonal God here, but only a tripersonal mass of matter. Um, in fact, the only tripersonal mass of matter is that smallest portion, which composes the Spirit and the Son, and which is part of what composes the Father. You could say that massive matter is tripersonal, but it's not a tripersonal God. There's only one God here, and um, he's sharing some of his matter without losing it, so that it comes to simultaneously compose more than one thing. But uh, he emphasizes that the Father is one entity, the Son is a second, and the Spirit a third. Nor are they parts of one whole. They simply share some of this divine stuff that he calls spirit. Though this results in two more who can be called God, in Tertullian's view, it does not introduce two more gods, not gods in the sense that Yahweh is a god. There is still, as there can only be, one ultimate source of all else, and that is the Father. Tertullian actually argues that it's a contradiction that there should be more than one ultimate source. So there couldn't be more than one divine being in the way the Father is divine. This is monotheism, whatever you think of it as Christology and pneumatology. And it is a Unitarian theology. God is unipersonal both at the start and at the end of this process. And it is not Trinitarian. No tripersonal deity appears, nor are the persons equally divine. Following the New Testament, and like Irenaeus, Tertullian holds that the Son is, quote, ignorant of the last day and hour, which is known to the Father only. What is Tertullian's answer to his monarchian critics? Does he argue that the Father and Son and Spirit are really one God? Does he argue one God is the Trinity? No. Instead, Tertullian replies, in essence, that a king may share his one kingdom with subordinate rulers, and yet it still may be one kingdom. Thus, God may share the governance of the cosmos with his son. <coughs> the monarchians would not have accepted this answer, but we must move on to our third theologian. Origen of Alexandria was the greatest Christian scholar in antiquity, an inhumanly prolific writer. He was a pioneer of textual criticism, apologetics, theology, and Christian philosophy. One of his most important surviving works is his eight-book work called Against Celsus, which was probably written around 246 to 248. Celsus was a pagan philosopher, essentially a cultural and religious conservative, who had written a book attacking Christianity, perhaps around 177 to 180. Decades later, it's not exactly clear why, Origen wrote a massive refutation of this book, quoting substantial portions of it. Here's an exchange from that book. So we're going to listen in on an argument here between this pagan philosopher and Origen. <coughs> Celsus writes, if these men, Christians, worship no other god but one, perhaps they would have a valid argument against the others. But in fact, they worship to an extravagant degree this man who appeared recently, Jesus, and yet think it is not inconsistent with monotheism if they worship his servant. Origen responds, 
I should say to this that if Celsus had considered the saying, I and my Father are one, and the prayer uttered by the Son of God in the words, as I and thou are one, he would not have imagined that we worship another besides the Supreme God. For the Father, he says, is in me, and I am in the Father. End quote. What is his argument here? One might jump to the conclusion that Origen thinks the Father and Son to be one God. Thus his point would be that in worshiping the Son, the Christians worship one and the same God they worship when they worship the Father. But that is not at all Origen's point. The passage immediately continues. If, however, anyone is perturbed by these words, lest we should be going over to the view of those who deny that there are two existences, he means the Father and Son, let him pay attention to the text and all those who believed were of one heart and soul, that he may see the meaning of I and my Father are one. Accordingly, we worship but one God, the Father and the Son, and we still have a valid argument against the others. Origen starts by denying that Christians consider Father and Son to be numerically identical. No, they are two entities, two beings. In the last sentence here, the way the translator has punctuated seems to make the sentence hint that the one God somehow is both Father and Son, but it's clear from Origen's works as a whole and from this section that he identifies the one God with the Father. The last sentence should be punctuated like this. We worship but one God, comma, the Father, comma, and the Son. Origen is clear that these are two, that there are two whom Christians worship. First, he makes the point that the Son pre-existed his human life. And then he says, Therefore we worship the Father of the truth and the Son who is the truth. They are two distinct existences, but one in mental, agree in mental unity, in agreement, and in identity of will. We worship the one God and his one Son, his logos and image, with the best supplications and petitions that we can offer, bringing our prayers to the God of the universe through the mediation of his only begotten Son. We bring them to him first, asking him who is a propitiation for our sins to act as a high priest, to bear our prayers and sacrifices and intercessions to the supreme God. And Kelsus cannot show that there is any discord in our belief about the Son of God. Indeed, we worship the Father by admiring his Son, who is Logos, wisdom, truth, righteousness, and all that we have learned the Son of God to be." End quote. Father and Son are one, he explains, in will, in purpose. That doesn't show that the Son and Father are one God, one object of worship, or that they are in any sense parts of one such God. But it shows that the Son is no rival to the Father. While Origen could be clearer, it is plain that he thinks that in one sense Christians worship two, Father and Son, but in another sense Christians worship one, the Father. As to the worship or honor given to the Son, this ultimately goes to the Father. I think Origen makes some excellent points, though more could be said about the term worship and varieties of worship. He's clearly right about John 10.30. But the pagan polytheist, polytheistic monotheist Celsus presses the attack. <coughs> Celsus says, if you Christians taught them that Jesus is not his, God's son, but that God is the father of all, and that we really ought to worship him alone, they, Christians, would no longer be willing to listen to you unless you included Jesus as well, who is the author of their sedition. Indeed, when they call him Son of God, it is not because they are paying very great reverence to God, but because they are exalting Jesus greatly. Origen answers, We have learnt who the Son of God is, even that he is an effulgence of his glory and the express image of his person. And we know that Jesus is the Son come from God, and that God is his Father. There is nothing in the doctrine which is not fitting or appropriate to God, that he should cause the existence of an only begotten Son of this nature." End quote. And a bit later, Origen argues, we affirm that this person is Son of God, 
yes, of God, to whom, if we may follow Celsus' words, we, pray, we pay very great reverence. And we know his son, who has been greatly exalted by the Father. But we may grant that some of those among the multitude of believers take a divergent view. And because of their rashness, suppose that the Savior is the greatest and the supreme God. But we at least do not take that view, since we believe him who said, the Father who sent me is greater than I. Consequently, we would not make him whom we now call Father subject to the Son of God, as Celsus falsely accuses us of doing. The Son is not mightier than the Father, but subordinate. We affirm that the Savior is Lord of all that has been subjected to him, but not that he is also Lord of the God and Father who is mightier than he. It is not our purpose to worship any merely assumed God, but to worship the creator of this universe and of all else which is not sensible or visible." End quote. I've met more than a few of these confused Christians that Origen mentions here, who because of their rashness suppose that the Savior is the greatest and supreme God. But let's review the exchange. Celsus pushes the point that a real monotheist would only worship God and suggests that Christians exalt Jesus at God's expense. Never mind how he might reconcile this with his acceptance of traditional polytheism. Origen replies that the Son deserves it because he really is God's Son, and God has exalted Jesus, so this worship of Jesus can't be to the dishonor of God. Well said, Origen. Note that for Origen, the Father is the one true God, and the Son is not. Unlike the theologians we've met so far, Origen seems to believe that the Son has always existed as a self alongside God, eternally caused to exist by God. But even though they are co-eternal, for him, God is greater than the Son, who is subordinate to him, and not just functionally subordinate. And worship goes to, but also through the Son, the ultimate object being God. But doesn't Origen call the Son God and say that he is divine? Indeed, he does, but he is clear about what he's doing. Listen to his words. Now, he, here he's going to make some of the points about God language that I made a bit before. Maybe, maybe it'll make more sense when Origen explains it. The word God with the article, so the Greek hotheos, is very God, wherefore also the Savior says in his prayer to the Father, that they may know you, the only true God. On the other hand, everything else, everything besides the very God, which is made God by participation in his divinity, would more properly not be said to be the God, but God. In other words, not ha theos in Greek, but just theos, also translatable as a God, lowercase. To be sure, his firstborn of every creature he means the Son, he's quoting Colossians there, inasmuch as he was the first to be with God and has drawn divinity into himself, is more honored than the other gods beside him, he's referring to Christians there, of whom God is said, as it is said, quote, the God of gods, the Lord has spoken and he is called the earth, quoting Psalm 49. It was by his, that is the Son's, the firstborn's ministry that they became gods for he drew from God that they might be deified, sharing ungrudgingly also with them according to his goodness. The God, that is the Father, therefore is the true God. The others are gods formed according to him as images of the prototype. But again, the archetypal image of the many images is the word with the, with the God who was in the beginning. By being with the God, he continues always to be God, the translator properly puts quotes there. But he would not have this if he were not with God, and he would not remain God if he did not continue in unceasing contemplation of the depth of the Father. End quote. So to paraphrase, the God is the Father. He is unique in that his deity isn't derived from another. Jesus is, in a sense, divine because of him, and so is a God, so are Christians. They too will be gods, ultimately because of the one God. Origen is assuming that it is wrong to numerically identify Father and Son. They differ and so can't be the same God. There are two to whom the word God applies. 
But there is just one who is the one true God. It's the one who is the source and explanation of all the others who can be called gods. We have seen that for origin, the one true God just is the Father. The Son, too, can be called a God and is caused to exist by God in a way that other things are not. But he nowhere says that the one God is the Trinity, or that the one God in some sense contains multiple persons, nor does he say that the members of the Trinity, small t, are equally divine. In fact, he explicitly denies it, that they're equally divine. Let's hear him one more time. But if the Father comprehends all things, and the Son is among all things, it is clear that he comprehends the Son. But someone will inquire whether it is true that God is known by himself in the same way in which he is known by the only begotten. And he will decide that the same, quote, my Father who sent me is greater than I, is true in all respects, so that even in his knowledge, the Father is greater and is known more clearly and perfectly by himself than by the Son, end quote. Notice that he doesn't argue that the Father is greater than Jesus' human nature, but equal with Jesus' divine nature. Nor does he argue that the Father knows more than the Son's human nature, but not more than the Son's divine nature. The Father, he thinks, is, quote, greater in all respects. Does Origen think that Jesus is divine? Yes. Can he be called God? Yes. Can he be worshipped or religiously honored? Yes. Does Origen think it follows that he is God's equal, another God alongside the one true God? No. Does he think this places Jesus somehow inside the one true God, so the God is now multipersonal? No. He is not a Trinitarian. But he does assert the one true God to be a certain perfect self, the one Jesus calls his Father. Thus, Origen, the greatest Christian scholar in antiquity, was a Unitarian. I suggest that theologians should take Unitarian theology more seriously. The so-called Arians of the fourth century were neither the first nor last Unitarians. Their views were broadly similar to the ones we have been exploring. So too are the views of a number of heavyweight intellectuals of early modern times, such as Samuel Clark, Nathaniel Lardner, and Andrews Norton. Their views too should be in play. A Trinitarian must establish that her theory better explains the evidence than theirs. To do this, she'll have to stop ignoring all Unitarian Christian theologies. It is fashionable and easier to ignore them, but it is not reasonable to do so. Finally, consider the common story that Christianity was always Trinitarian, but early on lacked terminology to properly express this. <coughs> if so, then these four champions of the early Catholic movement did not get the memo. <laughs> they vigorously insist on Unitarian theology, not in opposition to Trinitarian theology, which did not yet exist, but an, as an exposition of Christian monotheism, competing with various non-Christian religions and with various fashionable pseudo-Christian religions. The champions of creedal Trinitarian orthodoxy in the late fourth century believed that they were following in the footsteps of these early theologians. But facts are facts. Any Trinitarian disagrees with them on the core issue of who the one God is. They disagree with all the authors of the New Testament too, but that's another story. Thank you.